Good evening. If the profits made over the last 10 years by the big three automakers, Ford, General Motors, and Stellantis, which is what was used to be called Chrysler, if these profits were distributed among the 150,000 workers at those companies, every single one of them would get $1.7 million. That's close to $2 million per worker, more than enough to cover the UAW's demands. In fact, looking at it that way, the union's demands are kind of modest, just a 40% wage increase, equal pay for equal work for all, and a limit on the backbreaking intensity of work, including a shorter work week with no cut in pay. The workers' demands only sound extravagant because they are in amounts that we, ordinary people, can visualize. On the other hand, the company's profits are harder to picture. Millions, billions, all begin to sound alike. These aren't amounts that working class folks like us deal with in our everyday life not in my bank account and never in my paycheck. How about you? So my name is Roberta Wood. I'm a member of the National Board of the Communist Party, retired uh, worker, former steel worker, uh, sewage treatment plant worker, electric, uh, journeyman electrical instrument and testing mechanic, and now a senior editor of People's World. The auto workers, are not unique in our society. Their exploitation is not unique. In fact, of that 25 trillion, which is an unfathomable figure, 25 trillion is the value of all the goods and services produced in the United States in 2022. The auto workers aren't unique. In fact, of that 25 trillion only, 15 trillion goes to the workers who produce it. The other 10 trillion goes to those who do not work. This evening's class is on the productive forces. We're gonna focus on the development of the productive forces to see where this wealth comes from and what the implications of that are. But first, let's clarify some terminology. The 25 trillion I mentioned is the US's gross domestic product. It's a fancy word, a fancy term, but all it means is the total of everything of use that's produced in this country in a year. The gross domestic product includes things you can hold in your hand or touch, a bar of soap or a new high rise building. It includes things that exist in cyberspace like Instagram, and the GDP also includes intangibles, like a physical therapy session or skydiving classes. That 25 trillion covers everything each of us on this call and our mothers and sisters, our aunts, our grandmas, our brothers and cousins, our neighbors and coworkers, what all of us produce from avocado toast to ace bandages, from aspirin to aviation letters, lessons from allergy shots to animal care, an anagram, applesauce, attic cleaning services, and aggravation. Well, maybe not aggravation. They have to be useful products that people will pay for, and my grandkids give it to me for free. But don't worry, I'm not gonna go through the whole alphabet. I'll end with xylophones and zebra tattoos. The thing to remember is the gross domestic product is the sum of everything produced in the US in a year. And we're gonna circle back to that 25 trillion at the end of the hour. So stick around, I promise it's gonna be sweet. The title of this class is Productive Forces. There's so many confusing terms, everything about production and productive product. So a lot of important terms have that word product embedded in them. And here are some we'll get to know. We're gonna talk about, as we already have, the gross national product. We're gonna deal with the means of production. We're gonna to touch on the forces of production, and we're gonna talk about the relations of production. Stick with me, it's not that complicated. Production is at the root of being human. 
Production is what humans do. The human race started at zero. Like other animals, we access food directly from nature. But that's where there began a process that by interacting with nature's materials and with each other, humans made tools. It's true that other animals use tools, but humans don't just use tools, we make tools. We share that technology and we pass it down through generations. And humans, as we all know, made spears and ropes and nets. They hybridized seeds to produce crops. They learned how to, produce, to predict weather, bred animals and dug canals. Each generation did not start over from scratch, but the development of these technologies took place over tens of thousands of years. So what were the forces that drove this development? Let's talk about the means, what we call the means of production. That's a fancy way of saying tools and tools in a broad sense, whatever humans use to produce things, whether it's raw materials, technology, science, and of course, machinery and computers and data and so on. All of those are the means of production. Marxists say that there are two separate forces of production that get constantly interact with each other. One of those forces of production is humans, the workers. And the other is the means of production, what we just described, the tools. So the, the workers and the means of production interact with each other. And in the process, humans not only create the tools, but humans are in turn transformed when they use them. Engels, who was Marx's collaborator, studied this fascinating historical process. And you can read all about it in this book, The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, available from international publishers. Remember, the forces of production are the interaction of humans and their tools and they can be some pretty big tools, not just a hammer or a sickle, but how about the LAX, the Los Angeles airport, for example, or the internet? We call those tools large and small, the means of production. But never forget the means of production by themselves pr produce nothing. They sit there idle. It takes workers to activate them and workers are not blank slates. We are created by our interaction with this, his, with this uh, production process. So for this class, we're going to concentrate on, or we're going to focus in on the process starting just a few generations ago when the forces of production plunged into a dramatic spiral. And this is a, a um, chart of the GDP, not of the United States, the gross domestic product, but of the world over the last 2000 years. So you can see starting out in the year zero um, and all through the year 500 AD, 1000, 1500, it, it's so low that it doesn't even um, show on this chart, which is in trillions. And then suddenly at the very, uh, I guess it would be 1900, uh, you see it start to spiral upward. Um, so at the time uh, my grandmother was born, so not that long ago, in Iowa, 1876 to be exact, over half of the workforce in this country was, in, was tied up in, agri in agriculture. And agricultural technology wasn't much compared to today. They had the wooden plow, they didn't have fertilizer, only they only had mules and oxen, no machinery. And that meant that one worker could only produce on average enough to feed uh, two people. It took a lot of work and a lot of skill, but it, it didn't leave much of the population to do and much else. And the main means of, of production in this era was the land itself. So uh, in talking about this history, we can't neglect the history in the US of the ownership of that major means of production. And the history of that ownership, the way this, the setup for this was that across the territory, 
of the United States. The indigenous people had been systematically and genocidally dispossessed of their land, their means of production. In the North and the West of the country, the ownership of this land, this means of production, was turned over to individual settlers, European settlers, as well as to big corporations like railroads. And for a few generations, these small farmers, settlers and their descendants, then owned their own means of production. They owned their land, the tools that they had made themselves. And in the uh, agricultural field, since the means of production um, was, also, was primarily land, they also owned the tools and the beasts of burden like horses, mules, and oxen. Um, so in, in this case, much of the, uh, the ownership of the means of production was the same as the people who worked on it. And those people were able to use the products of their labor because they owned the means of production and were able to keep the, those proceeds. You know, we take it for granted, but because we live in this system, but um, the one who owns the means of production also owns the product, not the one who works the means of production. The one who owns the means of production owns the product. The one who works only gets a wage. And that ownership is embedded in our legal system and that ownership is protected by the state. <clears throat> In the South, in the aftermath of the slave plantation system, a lot of the land was owned by big landowners who allowed tenant farmers or sharecroppers to grow crops. Two thirds of the tenant farmers were white, a third were black, but the vast majority of black Southerners were sharecroppers. To be clear, those workers had skills. They had to know how to predict the weather. They had to know the technology of planting and of animal husbandry. They had to know carpentry and blacksmithing. Um, but agricultural work overall was often done in isolation and of course in rural areas. Since the plantation owners owned the land, they owned the products produced by the tenant farmers and sharecroppers. And the pro producers themselves were only allowed to keep a small portion. In spite of being isolated, these sharecroppers had a rich history of struggle to, to claim the products of their labor. So um, going back to the first decades of my grandmother's life, with the introduction of the steel plow and powered farm equipment, agriculture quickly became more productive. In the middle of this process, in 1910, only a third of the workforce was now involved in agriculture. At that time, the gross domestic product, the GDP of the whole country was $40 billion. And I'd like to graphically represent all those goods and products here. I'm gonna represent the 40 billion in goods and services with two tablespoons of sugar. Here we go. So these two tablespoons, represent all of the goods and services produced by all the people in that year, 2010. There you see it, okay. That's one ounce. Those uh, agricultural workers, especially those who didn't own any land, they didn't own any means of production. Where could they get food with no land? after they were no longer needed in agriculture, they were ripe to be forced into the new manufacturing sweatshops that were developing, as well as mines and railroads, et cetera. They had no rights whatsoever to land or to the tools they had used. They were the precise definition of the working class. They had no ownership of the means of production and the only way to survive was to sell their labor power to those who do own the means of production. I said was, but I should have said is because that's still the case. Even though they were the producers, the individual owners of the means of production owned the products of their labor. In addition, to these displaced agricultural workers, between the years 1900 and 1915, more than 15 million immigrants poured into the US 
mostly from Eastern and Southern Europe, but also from China, Japan, the Philippines, and other countries. That was an average of more than a million a year. And just as an interesting fact, in relation to the population at the time, that was a higher percentage than are arriving now. <clears throat> in the first decades of the 1900s, American industries and industri the whole industrial structure was built by this workforce. Railroads, canals, entire ports, coal, copper, zinc, iron ore mines, steel mills, construction materials like cement were, were uh, manufactured, sewage treatment plants were constructed, and all the machinery for the factories that churned out automobiles, telephones, washing machines, cloth, clothing, shoes, bicycles, baby buggies, dolls, footballs, packaged meat, canned tomatoes, record players, light bulbs, toilets, penicillin, and toilet paper among other things. These workers were transformed by their experience in the workplace. Everything about it was social. There were different nationalities and languages brought together. They worked in huge workplaces, collectively on assembly lines. They engaged in epic struggles and strikes. They dealt with inequality. They operated machinery, cars, telephones, they developed skills in machine repair, lathes, tailors. They learned to be to respect work. They were literate and worldly. I remember reading that the garment the garment workers at the early part of the century had book clubs in their little bit of time off where they discussed great ideas and philosophy. They also brought with them the legacies of struggles of their forebearers, whether it was of slave revolts, the tenant farmer fights, or the struggles of the refugees from Europe who were part of the socialist movement movements there. And don't forget, these workers also were created themselves as they created the means of production, including the technology. They learned how to organize and part of their their creation of themselves was to create unions and they created the communist party so we see a new kind of force of production remember the interaction of the workers with their tools with the means of production transforms them both so by 1960 the manufacturing force was made up made up the manufacturing workforce made up a third of the u.s workforce it had absorbed the displaced agricultural workers and the new immigrants. And now factory, there were very efficient factory farms. So it only took one in seven Americans working in agriculture to feed the nation. The gross domestic product in 1960 had risen to 543 billion. Okay, 543 billion. Remember before it was 40 billion. And just to give you a picture of how much that is, Let's put that on the scale. It's 13.5 ounces, almost a pound. That's 1960. The year 1960 marked the peak of manufacturing employment. After that, the quantity of goods continued to increase, but the number of factory workers started to decrease. Why? With automation, many jobs that had been done by humans were done by machines. When I worked in a steel mill in the 70s, it was full of people. There's my crew. The alloy bar mill, US Steel, 1974. It was full of people banding bundles of steel, whizzing by in forklifts, inspecting billets, grinding off imperfections. Today, if you go to the floor of a steel mill, it's like a ghost town. All of those jobs that I mentioned can be done by machines and only a handful of workers in the control room high above the production floor direct the process and repair is one of the main activities. However, the steel is coming out like never, just like it was before. So in the decades of the 80s and 90s, there were great layoffs. 
in plant shutdowns as technology shifted. And these job losses, of course, were blamed, the bosses always blamed it on what they incorrectly called deindustrialization. But industry didn't go anywhere. It was depopulated in the same way that a much smaller agricultural workforce was able to feed the whole nation using new technology. The industrial workforce had become immensely more productive and could provide all of the goods that were needed. We workers we call that kind of a thing, <clears throat> working yourself out of a job. And actually, working yourself out of a job should be a good thing. It should be good for humans to move beyond backbreaking labor, working in a cloud of toxic fumes in the middle of the night, freezing on one side and burning up on the other. But when you don't own the means of production, working yourself out of a job brings you no benefits. It only brings hardship. So, once again, the next generation of workers cut off from the means of production have to sell their labor power to survive. The new industries that developed, retail, fast food, are highly profitable but poorly paid. Manufacturing jobs had been highly unionized through hard fought battles and were better compensated. The new jobs are, that's sometimes explained that the new jobs are unskilled. That's a term used by arrogant management types. I hate the term unskilled labor. Just ask any capitalist lackey who uses that term to do your job and he'll find an excuse to turn it back over to you in a minute, whether you're a nursing home aide or you're running the fryer at Mickey D's. The new jobs were lower paid, not because they were less skilled or less valuable, but because they had less unionization. So more and more workers had to sell their labor power to what we call the service industries, not manufacturing products, but producing products of human labor nevertheless, such as healthcare and education. And today, uh, healthcare and education each con uh, comprise more than 10% of our workforce, together um, much more um, than the manufacturing or, uh, of course, agriculture. And by the year 2000, less than 2%, 2% of the workforce was involved in agriculture. And these new services that the workers moved into vastly added to the gross domestic product, the products of our labor. The gross domestic product rose to 10 trillion. So you can see now we moved out of the billions and into the trillions. And the equivalent of that is of that 10 trillion is 15.6 pounds of sugar and go we can't weigh it on the scale anymore here's four eight twelve and this bit left of this bag here this is 2010. That's a representation of the gross domestic product. But one thing still hasn't changed. The individual owners of the means of production own the products of, their, of our labor. The individual owners, the owners of the means of production who are individuals own the collective products of our labor. That huge, this huge, GDP was produced collectively by hundreds of millions of workers, but it was owned privately by a tiny number of capitalists. So how about 2010? That's a year most of us remember, 13 years ago. The GDP then was 15 trillion. So now we're up to 23.4. Let's see, we've got four, eight, 12, 16, 20, and almost 24, there we go, pounds of sugar. That's our GDP.
not only have the means of production developed, we have now we have MRIs, we have new drugs, we have vaccines, you have the iPhone 13, you have air fryers, solar and wind power, but also highly skilled professionals from doctors to engineers have been driven from their practices and joined the working class because they also could not control their means of production. We have a working class today that has been transformed. It's highly educated, and I don't just mean in the formal sense, and I don't agree with the way that uh, people who are not college educated are considered not educated, but people are educated in trades, and more and more they're self-educated. Our, our generation of workers is sophisticated. They're interlinked with each other. They're conscious of the whole world. They're proficient in so, social media. And think about this. All of these workers are more computer literate than Albert Einstein. They can operate a machine that can access the entire knowledge of the world. They're cognizant of their history. They're developing a sense of self as a class and they have experience in social justice movements. They're engaged in discussions, sometimes too much, like 24 seven online, but there's something else new. They're highly interested in self-government. They're thinking about the processes of how things run or could run or should run and how they can be organized. Do you think that could be an indication of a class preparing itself to take things over? I do. So today, everybody's talking about AI. It's our working class that invented AI, the AI that will usher in unimaginable increases in production and the possibility of improvement of life of human beings. But because we don't own the means of production, we don't democratically and collectively control its implementation. And that's a problem and a challenge. So the last year I have figures for, uh, is last year, 2022, and that's where, you know, we saw this figure before, the GDP was $25 trillion. And now we can represent the productivity of our working class with 39 pounds of sugar. So I've got 4, 8, 12, 16, 24, 28, 32, 36 and almost 40. Remember where we started in 1900 with one ounce? Now, where is all this sugar going? Well, as we said before, uh, 15 uh, trillion of it is going to wages and benefits, which goes to the producers us, the ones who activate the means of production. The other 11 trillion goes to the owners of the, mil of the means of production who don't do shit. So, um, so th that leads me to make a comment here. I wanted uh, to note that we hear a great deal about inequality in our society, and it's absolutely true that there is great inequality within the group of producers, within our working class and incomes can range from minimum wage to the lucky few making hundreds of thousands. But that inequality isn't shit compared to the fundamental inequality here. The inequality that exists between the producers, us who activate the means of production and the ones who, whose only involvement in the production process is to own the means of production. And you could see that huge inequality and in how the GDP is divided. Uh, it struck me in an earlier class when Dee pointed out that it's true that millions of Americans do live in absolute poverty, homeless and hungry. But as she also pointed out, even the rest of us, like those auto workers on the picket line who might have a roof over their head, might have a car in the driveway, might have a big screen TV in the living room, but we're still poor. We're poor relative to the products we create, and this manifests itself in our everyday life. For example, even with a great insurance, 
we can't get a doctor's appointment for months. We're trapped in a dysfunctional health system. We're poor in that we don't have recreational activities for our kids after school. We're poor because we don't have a cultural life in our neighborhoods of music and film and sports. We're poor in time driving between two and three jobs and having to drive our kids everywhere. And most of all, we're poor in not being able to guarantee a viable future for our next generations, a future with a livable environment, the most important thing that people want. We live in the richest society in the history of the world and we are poor. We're poor relative to the life that we could have if we could enjoy the fruits of our labor. So, tonight, we've gone through the gradual and then sudden snowballing development of the forces of production, the means of production, plus the workers as humans become more and more productive. So here's some of the terms that we have talked about or will talk about. We talked about the gross national product. We talked about the means of production, the forces of production, and we're going to talk about the relations of production. So as I promised you, we're going to hear that word production quite a bit. Um, so I want to look at the, that last term, uh, the relations of production. The relations of production uh, is the relationship between the class of people who own the means of production and the class of people who don't own the means of production. So what is that relationship? What's the relationship between the people who own the means of production and the class of people who don't own the means of production? Here's that relationship and it's a bad relationship. The class that doesn't own the means of production has to sell their labor power to those who do in order to survive. And the class that does own the means of production lives off the labor of those who don't, lives off the labor of those who don't. So we could kind of boil it all down to this. This is the relations of production. We make it, they take it. We make it, they take it. At every stage in this process, as the forces of production have been revolutionized over and over, the one thing stays the same. The individual owners of the means of production keep on owning the products of our labor. That does not evolve, that does not change. Those who own the means of production, not those who do the work, own the products of our labor. We make it, they take it. And although the forces of production have evolved as we've seen the growing productivity and changes in the workforce, the relations of production are frozen, the same relations as at the start of the Industrial Revolution 150 years ago. Those relations, we make it, they take it. And that's why the wealth produced collectively by humanity is increasingly concentrated. And this has resulted in some bizarre things. Elon Musk in space. What are these guys gonna do with all their uh, money? Okay, Trump with his golden toilets. And the latest, this was found in Congressman Menendez's closet, stacks of gold bars and dollar bills, or I shouldn't say that, hundred dollar bills shoved into pockets. They don't know, it's so much, they don't know what to do with it. Eating that much sugar can make you sick. So let's review what we've covered today and some conclusions. First, the auto workers deserve everything they're demanding and much more. Their, their demands only sound extravagant because they're so underpaid. Second, production. It's what humans do. So some of the terms, the Marxist terms we've touched on, the means of production, the tools, the technology and raw materials workers use. The forces of production, two interacting forces, the workers and the means of production. And 
the relations of production, the relationship between those who own the means of production and those who do the work. We make it, they take it. So the relations of production are frozen in that mode, the mode of we make it, they take it. It's not changing gradually, not like it doesn't correspond to the evolution of production. And the conclusion is we have to change the ownership of the means of production. The workers need to own the means of production collectively in the same way we produce all the wealth. But this does not happen gradually. It does not happen on the on its own. It takes a collect, it takes a conscious working class. It takes a revolution. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Roberta. We'll now open the floor for discussion. Uh, we have a, a moderator trainee tonight. Uh, Eric, would you please open your mic and facilitate the, the discussion? Yes, thank you, Dee. Thank you, Bobby. That was excellent. And we'll take all comments and questions first, and then we'll turn it over to our panelists. Let's go to Marianne. Marianne, I am unmuting your mic. I just wanted to say thank you to you, Roberta, because you your examples and the way you described it, I mean, I just I under, was unable to understand a lot of concepts that were very difficult for me. So thank you very much. OK, great. Thank you. And um, now let's go to Melissa. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks, Roberta, for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way that we could uh, kind of collapse this into like a pamphlet to be used um, for the, uh, the labor um, workers in educating them on this. Thanks. Thank you. Let's next go to Joseph. Hi, I just want to say also thank you, Roberta, for a wonderful lecture. And I love the way you use the sugar, which so really concretized the whole concept. And I really want to thank you uh, for this. Thanks. Thank you. And Jack, Jack, I've just unmuted your mic. Hi. I have a question about an ad that I've been seeing. There's an ad for an AI product that sends emails, organizes meetings, other sort of professional managerial class tasks. And it seems to me that a lot of college educated folks are going to be out of a job in the near future. My question is, what do you think the labor landscape will look like in the next 10 years, given AI coming onto the scene? Thank you. So let's go to Carlos. I just want to say uh, thank you, and uh, that was a really good question uh, to the last. Uh, I was looking for your last name. I apologize through the email, so uh, I couldn't find it. I'll just say Roberta. Uh, I'm calling from Kentucky. You know, uh, this was a, a pretty good lecture today, and again, the sugar was a really good analogy. You know how it started from like just one grain, and it, it was a really big growth. You know, but uh, the workers' share really hasn't grown. Uh, it really should be higher. Yeah, uh, that's all I've got. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And we'll go to Larry. All right. Can you hear uh -huh. me? Yes. Good. The question is this, which I actually wrote up also in the in the in the chat. If a U.S. corporation owns and operates a factory or a, a, a agricultural unit overseas in an imperialistic fashion, let's say, but in any case. Does that accrue to the GDP of the uh, of the U.S. even though the, the production or the extraction of minerals is from overseas sources? How do they figure that as the U as the GDP of the U.S.? Thank you, Larry. So with that, um, let's turn it back over to our our presenter, Bobby. Thank you uh, for all your kind remarks. Um, it's been my goal to try to um, break down, to get rid of term jargon. So if you have any suggestions on other ways to do that, I think because we Marxism is the working class is science and we it needs to be available to everyone. 
um, and Melissa, if you would like to help make this into a pamphlet, let's do it together. Um, so um, I wanted to, I don't have an answer to about the AI products. I mean, I obviously it's gonna transform the workplace, but it, this isn't the first um, new technology um, that's, that's revolutionized the workplace. It seems that that's the nature of, of uh, how the uh, forces of production work. And I predict that um, it will uh, create a lot of new products and advances in science and medicine um, and uh, even greater possibilities for improvement of human life. What's maybe the most important thing is that it should free up, all of these should free up time and energy for humans to do really human endeavors, to do art, to do uh, quilting, <laughs> to do um, skydiving, or um, you know, to go to theaters and do plays and read to each other and do all of the things that, that are human as well as do a much better job on education and healthcare. But if, the, if those things aren't profitable, they don't happen. And that's why um, I think that what AI will do is make an even clearer case for why we need the uh, social ownership of the means of production. Uh, it, it just sharpens that contradiction. And it may increase our ability to communicate with each other and to, to coordinate. Um, I don't think it's the end of the world, but I think it's very, there's big stakes there that we have to be involved in. Um, so Larry wanted to know if a U.S. corporation owns and operates a factory overseas. The products of that factory, no, don't count as part of our GDP. Although um, I think, and I, you know, when you try to do these things, you have to kind of simplify stuff it's really almost inaccurate to just talk about the US economy because the world economy is so integrated. There's no product that's made in one country. I think I read like an iPhone is made in a hundred different countries and the different parts are put together and transportation and communication are such a huge part of the means of production now. So um, it really emphasizes the need for us to have solidarity with workers in other countries. We have so much in common. Um, so um, let's see. And then and I just wanted to uh, uh, comment on uh, the sugar. So if anybody wants to buy any of the sugar, I'll sell it to you cheap. That's, I had to go to Aldi's and buy 15 four pound packages to make this presentation. Other than that, um, glad you liked it. And um, I would like to invite everyone to stay in touch with me. It, let's talk about some of these ideas, some things you don't agree with, some things that you uh, wanna know more about, or you have a different idea on, or especially if you wanna draw some pictures that illustrate them that we can use in future discussions. Um, thanks a lot for your attendance. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Roberta, again. We do have our, our next class on Thursday night, which will concern, uh, what will it concern? The class Thursday night will concern the class structure in, in the United States with a focus on big capital, which, uh, and, the, and a focus on small capital. Then we have uh, uh, two classes Saturday, um, September 30th, in the morning, we'll look at uh, special uh, questions within the U.S. working class, meaning uh, uh, racial, national uh, oppression, and I think there will be a deep dive as it relates to youth. Then, in the after, uh, young workers. Then, in the afternoon, we will we will have a very broad-ranging, friendly discussion about what makes us similar as working class people. What are our traits and characteristics, culture, across ethnic, across racial, across gender lines? What makes us similar as work working class people? So we hope you'll join us uh, Thursday and Saturday. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, 
uh, have a, uh, we hope you uh, are able to relax for the rest of your evening. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Roberta.